This is a program of the, of the Greater Boston Group of the Sierra Club and uh, Biodiversity for a Livable Climate. And all the organizers and presenters have worked to make um, this as interesting, inspiring, productive, and pleasant for you as possible. And so we hope that we succeed in doing that. Um, my name is John Pitkin. I'm a retired climate activist, which is a full-time job. <laughs> uh, the hat, particular hat that I'm wearing today is chair of the Greater Boston Group of the Sierra Club, the Massachusetts chapter. And since I live in Cambridge, I can say welcome to Cambridge to those of you uh, here from other cities and towns in the region. Um, the Greater Boston Group and the, and the, and the, and the, the Bio for Climate have worked um, in partnership uh, with our, with our uh, as sponsors to, uh, to organize this conference, which is not sponsored or affiliated with Harvard University, but we would like to thank them for the use of this magnificent space. Um, <laughs> um, uh, Director of uh, Biodiversity, Microclimate Adam Sachs, and staff Paula Phipps provided invaluable assist assistance, advice, and when needed, encouragement in organizing this. John Mingle, who is a volunteer with Fire for Climate, is going to be videotaping it, uh, which uh, the videotapes uh, will be available after the conference and posted online. Um, uh, um, my colleagues from the Sierra Club, Kevin O'Brien, uh, uh, have helped. He says on the staff, he's doing registrations. Island Kelly on the staff. I'd also, also like to acknowledge members of the, of the Greater Boston Group, uh, David Hyman, Sue Butler, Dan Dash, and Michelle Absherley, who are helping with the arrangements. And they're, they're your volunteers for the day, and they're go-to people when you have questions about arrangements. Also, I'd like to acknowledge Casey Bowler, who is also helping out, and John Hickson. And uh, uh, Alexander Williams did the graphics of the, on, the beautiful, on the beautiful program. She did a lovely job. Um, This conference is at and about the intersection of climate action and environmental action. We have two great, uh, two great problems facing humanity today, among, among others, but two of them are climate change and the environmental crisis of uh, degradation and ongoing rapid extinctions that are happening around the world. Uh, and in a way, the, the basic idea is, is was summed up by, a, by, a, by a, a president who was not noted for his eloquence, but who said something I think is quite relevant to our agenda for today. It's, it was Dwight Eisenhower. He said that if you can't find the solution to a problem, enlarge it. And he knew something about complex systems because he had he had, he had been the commander in chief of the allies in forces in Europe in World War II. And there really is something to be said for thinking about ecosystems as our allies in a common struggle. And, uh, and understanding that fully at a global level, and the potential for carbon drawdown, which is a subject, there's a, one of the books for sale here is, is Paul Hawkins' Drawdown, and how ecosystems can can draw, I literally draw carbon out of the atmosphere in different ways. Uh, uh, during the course of the day, we'll learn many, uh, you'll, you might find many other ways in which uh, ecosystems in our region are our allies, and to have a deeper understanding of that and what that means and what our relationships to them is, not just as resources, natural resources or property, but as allies whom we must respect and consider and consider their needs. Um, after the morning morning speakers, where you will hear much hear more about these ideas uh, at lunch, you'll be asked to participate in workshops. You'll be invited to participate in workshops about what people are are doing in in their lives here in the region to revitalize and restore ecosystems in practical ways. 
it will be an opportunity to think about putting the insights and inspiration to the morning's presen presentations into practice in your own lives in ways that work for you. Um, at the very end of the day, we will reconvene here to report on common themes and learnings from the workshops for future action in our lives and our communities. When we leave the conference at the end, or if you leave sooner, we'd like to ask you for a little bit of feedback, a few pieces of information, a short statement, no longer than a tweet or two about the most important thing that you learned or practice that you are taking from the conference. This conference is for you and about what you all, and we all, are going to do in our lives starting tomorrow and in the future, and the choices we make and the practices we follow. Um, just as to help you on, on, in this journey through the day, we have some refreshments provided there, food and drink. Uh, it's uh, fuel for the, and uh, hopefully they'll keep you keep you going. But the lunch is, 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 is if you didn't bring it, you can, you'll have to go out and get it. Um, um, and there also is food for the thought in the books that will be available for sale, too. Um, but let's get started. And before I introduce our, 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 our topic, before I introduce our first speaker, I need to briefly introduce you to our region um, and the situation it and we who live here face and that brings us here today. Um, Greater Boston is not just a, a political or, 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 or statistical construction, but it is a physical reality. Here's a, here's a space shot for a Landsat photo of the Boston metro area. Makes it apparent. Um, there's a sea, you can see the sea and the shorelines, uh, rivers, the green forests or fields, and the gray coating of buildings and pavement in the center, near the center. Um, but there is, a, there is another dimension to this, which is the, the, the topography that defines it. And it's ringed by higher land, which is made clear in this image from Carl Hagelin's book, Imagining the Charles River. You can see the boundaries. Uh, starting with uh, from the south with the uh, Great Blue Hills, in the west by Prospect Hill and Bear Hill, in the north the Middlesex Fells. And uh, it's, defined, it's drained by three major rivers, the, the Charles, the Mystic, and the Neponset, and a number of lesser streams. Um, looking at downtown Boston, you can also you get a sense of the, of the buildings. You can actually see the buildings in this photograph rising up from the financial district. And uh, you get a sense of the vulner Boston's vulnerability to sea, sea level rise, um, uh, which is projected to be at least one and a half feet, by, and storm surges on top of that by the middle of the century, which is barely a little over 30 years away. It's not that far away. But up to 10 feet at the end of the century. And of course, we saw water in the Seaport District and in the area of the aquarium just in the Nor'easters at the beginning of the month. So it's not, it's not in the far, far, far future that, that Boston is going to be dealing with this. Other challenges are going to be extreme heat, a tripling of 90 degree days expected very likely by the end of the, end of the next decade, um, uh, with attendant changes in, 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 in vegetation and all kinds of ecosystems. Uh, and of course, flooding from extreme storm events. It's impossible to imagine what Boston is going to look like in the future. But one way of thinking about it is thinking about what it looked like in the past, which we know we actually have some information about. And there is this wonderful map that maybe some of you may have seen, by, but it's called the Pelham map. It was, it was made in, in 1777 by Henry Pelham, uh, who wanted to show the theater of battle in the Revolutionary War for the people in, in, in England who didn't understand all this business. Well, well where were Lexington and Concord and Helen? What was, what was, what was this thing? Where was Bunker Hill and so forth? And it shows, it's an interesting map because it actually shows the whole region, uh, has a regional scale and, but, but has considerable detail on what was actually here at the time the vegetation, the marshes, and described with features of military interest but also of ecological interest. Um, 
uh, for the ecosystems. It actually is, it is a kind of, uh, I, I don't know if there's the first map of the ecosystems of the region, but you could consider it that. It also has information about artillery ranges and, and sighting, but it's, it's a, so it's a, it's a kind of a, it's a dual purpose. Uh, and if you zoom in, you can see the extent of the Charles River, the Back Bay, uh, which really was a bay, a very extensive bay. Um, and the marshes and little 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 cove uh, where MIT is now built, um, and where we are standing today, uh, or where we are sitting today, in, in the old Cambridge here, which is a little bit higher, and sort of point out that there's the Charles River. The north is sort of a little lot. The north is in this direction, so it's a little not, not quite the way you normally orient the map. Um, and the Boston Peninsula here. Um, and from this map, it's possible to imagine what it might have looked like here from landscapes that we have, we're familiar with elsewhere uh, from this reconstruction. And there actually was a reconstruction of them. Here is a zoom in of, of Cambridge, of the Cambridge side of the, of the, of the Charles and where we are. And you can see the old, these, that, that I, that's, uh, I don't know the names of the streets here. I have to, I have to puzzle that out. But it's, the, all the details are here, and you can see there were wooded there were wooded areas. There they were all there were there were the beginnings of ro a road network, but there were indications of forest. And where there were this was a meadow, uh, looking from between between Harvard, the high ground of Old Cambridge, and the mm -hmm. and the and the Shawmut Peninsula. And based on that um, that information, uh, there was a we actually have a, an imagination of what it looked like to look. To Boston, from near where we are today, <coughs> this recreation. It's, um, and this is, this is an interesting image, based probably on Helen's map and other information about what existed at the time. Uh, it's it's it is a photograph of a diorama of Cambridge at the time of the Revolutionary War. It was, it was some of you may have seen it. It used to be in the Widener Library at Harvard. It's now warehouse somewhere else. It still exists, but it's not available for public. It's a wonderful, it's a wonderful um, exhibit. Um, this is a photograph that was taken and published in, 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 in Carl Tanglin's book that I mentioned earlier. Looking towards um, Boston. I mean, it's hard to imagine what this felt like at the time, but, um, but if we think back 200 years, what it was like, like Maybe we have some idea of the extent of the changes that might be possible in the next 200 years. It's a way of thinking about that, but also imagining what it is that our city, our city, cities that are here in the pavements, the buildings were built on, and what might be, what there might, what might still remain. And I want to just think about what the sights and the sounds were, and just to, just to reflect a little bit on thinking back and forward as to what. The, the distant past and the distant future might hold, might hold, and just try to imagine. Think, think about, if you look at this, think about this, what it sounds like, the sound of water, and if this was a place of shores and waters. waters be? What will this place look like when our children and grandchildren reach my age or hopefully older? It's a, it's a puzzle and it's something that we uh, can only imagine uh, but we can do something about.